Greetings to you who are studying OBGYN, wherever you may be in the world. My name is Diana Wolf, and I'm on the faculty at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I'm a subspecialist in maternal fetal medicine, and I'm very, very happy to be a part of Elevate and to give a series of lectures on hypertension and pregnancy. So I'd like to start first with an introduction of the topic of hypertension and pregnancy. So the learning objectives of this lecture is to understand the burden of disease of hypertension and pregnancy, also define the different hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, and also to explain the physiologic changes in pregnancy that affect blood pressure. And then also to talk about at the first prenatal visit or a preconceptual visit, what to think about in terms of hypertension and pregnancy. So preeclampsia affects about five to eight percent of pregnancies in the US and three to 14 percent of pregnancies worldwide. It actually affects four to five cases per 10,000 live births in developed countries and it's the second leading cause of death in the United States. This is some data from the United States. In Caucasians, it affects about 4.6% in the older population and 0.6% in the younger population. It's, as you can see, as age increases, the prevalence increases. But if you look at the African American population, the prevalence is much higher, 22.3% in 30 to 39 year olds. And preeclampsia is also affected by chronic hypertension. Chronic hypertension prior to the pregnancy, it affects a fourth of those patients and 4% of normotensive. So it's a lot less prevalent in people who have normal blood pressure prior to pregnancy. And worldwide, as you can see, these are just some incidences from various countries. As you can see, the overall incidence in the U.S. is much lower of eclampsia. And that is probably because we manage it in the antepartum period and the intrapartum period, perhaps with resources, and we'd like to develop that in other countries as well. Maternal mortality is about 600,000 pregnancy-related maternal deaths worldwide, and 15% is estimated to be due to preeclampsia and eclampsia. That's huge, so we really need to think about what we're doing and how to prevent this. This is a map of the world, and it shows you maternal deaths per 100,000 live births all over the world, red being the highest, and you can see where those countries are. Many of them are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Continuing with the burden of disease, perinatal mortality rate for infants born to hypertensive mothers increases as the maternal blood pressure increases. Our goal in pregnancy is to keep the systolic blood pressure less than or equal to 140 and the diastolic blood pressure less than or equal to 90. Now let's talk about the classification of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. There's chronic hypertension, that's one class. Another class is preeclampsia and eclampsia. Third class is preeclampsia superposed on chronic hypertension. Fourth, gestational hypertension. And fifth, transient hypertension. So let's talk about how we define these. Hypertension that's diagnosed beyond 20 weeks. Traditionally, preeclampsia is when there is protein in the setting of high blood pressure. However, I will talk about in a separate lecture some new definitions that have recently been proposed in the United States for defining preeclampsia without proteinuria. But traditionally, hypertension diagnosed beyond 20 weeks in the setting of proteinuria equals preeclampsia. When there's no protein in the urine, Prior to 20 weeks, it's gestational hypertension. However, if the high blood pressure persists beyond 12 weeks postpartum, it's chronic hypertension. And if it resolves by 12 weeks postpartum, then it was just a transient hypertension of pregnancy. 
One way that we can assure that we make a good diagnosis, an appropriate diagnosis, is to reduce the inaccurate readings of blood pressure. And this includes having an appropriate size cuff. So the length should, of the cuff should be 1.5 times the upper arm circumference of a cuff with a bladder, meaning that that surrounds the circumference of the arm, that encircles 80% or more of the arm. That being said, the pressure should be taken when the patient is in an upright position after a 10 minute or longer rest period. Inpatients should take the blood pressure while the patient is sitting up or in the left lateral recumbent position with the patient's arm at the level of the heart. Also, the patient should not use tobacco or caffeine for 30 minutes preceding the measurement and a mercury sphygmomanometer is preferred as opposed to a digital blood pressure cuff. So if we make sure that we take the blood pressure in a proper way, then we can assure that we're getting the right diagnosis and that we're not underdiagnosing or overdiagnosing patients. So uh, just to brief, there's a lot of physiologic changes in pregnancy, as you know, but just to go over a few that affect hypertension, one is the blood volume increases and this further stretches the heart. Also, the colloid oncotic pressure decreases, which can lead to cardiac decompensation. And the blood pressure decreases at the end of the first trimester. So between about 14 weeks and about 24, 28 weeks, the blood pressure is decreased due to the excessive volume, plasma volume, and blood volume that occurs in pregnancy. And a lot of times, those patients who are actually chronic hypertensives, if they don't come for their first prenatal visit until they're in this second trimester, you may miss the diagnosis that they're actually chronic hypertensives. And therefore, when they enter the third trimester and their blood pressure all of a sudden rises, you think they're a preeclamptic or a gestational hypertensive when in all actuality, they may have been a chronic hypertensive. So that being said, it's very important to advocate for your patients to get preconceptual care or the minute that they miss their first menstrual period to go for their first prenatal visit right away. Approach of the first prenatal visit or the preconceptual visit, really you want to ask them, those who are chronic hypertensives, what the duration of their disease is. You want to evaluate the end organs, including the heart and the kidneys and the eyes. So a patient who's had hypertension for 15 years, whether it's been controlled or not, you may find somebody with cardiomegaly, ischemic heart disease, renal involvement, and retinopathy. And these are all things that can get much worse in pregnancy. So it's very important to know what their baseline is. A full physical exam, including listening to the heart and lungs, and also examining the eyes and the rest of the body is very important. Tests include an EKG, maternal echocardiogram, if available, ophthalmologic exam, and a renal ultrasound, depending on how long your patient has had hypertension and what kind of diseases, disease problems they've had prior to this pregnancy or in their last pregnancy. So that that will allow you to explain to the patient their risks that, they, that you can foresee during the pregnancy and the risks that they are taking during the pregnancy so they have an understanding of what to expect. So that completes my introduction to hypertension. Thank you.